Hello everyone, I'm Guillaume Neza, the co-founder and the CEO of Holit. Holit is a French company created in 2013, based in Aix-en-Provence in the south of France with 10 employees. Expert in human breast analysis, Holit has a know-how in the design of miniaturized non-dispersive infrared gas sensor. We started our first development by trying to solve a societal problem in terms of road safety and public health with alcohol consumption. Alcohol is the leading cause of road deaths in Europe, about 50,000 deaths a year and several hundred thousand injured. Alcohol-related deaths are preventable and must be reduced with the right tools. Assessing, measuring and monitoring are the keys to good alcohol management. After six years of R&D and industrialization, we designed our first product, Osigo, a reusable and connected breathalyzer that integrates our miniaturized infrared spectroscopy technology. In this presentation, I will present the main technological challenges that we faced during the development of our infrared spectroscopy sensors. Our technology is based on the principle of infrared light absorbed by a sample at a specific wavelength. Our sensor consists of a cuvette crossed by an infrared light to a detector. The molecular composition of the target gas causes an absorption of energy at a specific wavelength. This attenuation is measured by the detector combined with a bandpass optical filter that eliminates all other wavelengths that the selected gas molecule may absorb. Finally, the gas concentration is calculated according to the Bear Lambert law. NDIR systems are commonly used for their reliability because the wear and the drift are very negligible compared to other technologies. Another benefit of this technology it is accuracy because there are few interferences with other gases that the one targeted. But NDIR spectrometers are generally bulky, non-mobile systems, and not dedicated to analyze samples with high humidity as the hexal hair. Miniaturization and portability of these spectrometers were a real challenge. Indeed, according to the Bear Lambert law, the longer the optical path, the more sensitive the system is. Developing a miniaturized and mobile spectrometer to analyze compounds in the exhaled air required to manage the accuracy of the measurement and the electrical consumption of the system. By combining high-performance components, algorithm, and specific designs, we came up with a miniaturized NDIR sensor dedicated to breast samples analysis. First, we developed a patented cuvette that offers a heating system and a high optical reflective layer. By combining these two features, we obtain a cuvette that allows the analysis of high humidity samples while maintaining the accuracy of the measurement as described in the Bear Lambert law. In addition, the detector and powerful algorithm allowed us to obtain a sensor with a detection threshold of around 20 ppm for heat and air measurement. Another benefit of the cuvette is its low thermal inertia. It allows a startup time of about 30 seconds and a saving of electrical energy. The aerolic sampling was designed by simulation to comply with the physiological differences between individuals and avoid thermal disturbances. Finally, the infrared source has been designed and managed to optimize the infrared radiation intensity and the electrical consumption. OSIGO is the result of six years of research and testing. It is one of the best performing breathalyzers on the market in terms of accuracy, reliability, and robustness. OSIGO integrates OC Engine NDIR sensor and a rechargeable battery into a compact design. It complies with the European and North American standards for electronic breathalyzers. It can even indicate false positive results by detecting residual alcohol in the mouse. As you can see on the graph on the bottom left, we can monitor optical signal at a sufficient frequency to determine the integrity of a breast sample. OSIGO also offers long-term reliability, avoiding any calibration for 18 months. Breath analysis is one of the non-invasive methods that may be used by most people and allows high-frequency tests. To meet this aim, the upcoming technology has to be easy to use, reliable, mobile, and break fast results. 
Polit has developed innovative miniaturized NDIA sensor with high sensitivity, specificity, and reliability. Our perspective is to go further to detect and measure other volatile organic compounds in hexal hair thanks to our NDIA technology. Either breast metabolites after drug or substrate administration or ontogenously produced breast compounds due to a particular physiological state could be measured with such systems. Our first explorative results focused on the analysis of carbon dioxide, one of the most representative markers of a person metabolic state in exhaled air. Indeed, this gas can be a marker of respiratory disorders, but can also allow other applications such as knowing the fertile period of a woman. We have already succeeded in adapting our OC engine sensor for CO2 analysis, and we are now focused on new gas analysis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for visiting this poster entitled Changes in Exhaled Volatile Organic Compounds Following Iron Supplementation in Self-Reported Healthy Adults. I am Nabitha Nagalingam, Principal Translational Scientist at Owlstone Medical Limited. It is my pleasure to review the findings of this study, which was done in close collaboration with the Functional Gut Clinic. Here we investigated the effects of iron supplementation on healthy adults. Iron deficiency anemia is a global problem affecting more than 1.2 billion people. Right here in the UK, it accounts for about 13% of gastroenterologists' referrals. Iron deficiency anemia can be treated with iron supplementation, either intravenously or orally. However, unabsorbed iron can cause gastrointestinal symptoms such as bloating. This is believed to be associated with intestinal microbiome changes induced by the iron treatment. These intestinal gases, including hydrogen and methane, can be absorbed by the intestinal tract and into the circulatory system. They can then be transported to the lungs where they can diffuse through the gut lung lining and be exhaled. Breath tests can then detect these gases. Tests for detecting changes in the intestinal environment can be facilitated by using fermentable carbohydrates such as lactulose. Lactulose can be metabolized by intestinal bacteria rapidly, producing gases within 180 minutes. The time at which these gases are detected can be linked to regions in the gut where the bacterial metabolism is most active thus providing insight on how iron treatment affects the regions along the gut. In this trial, 25 healthy volunteers provided breath samples collected in breath bags following lactulose ingestion. Figure 1 shows that samples were collected at four time points, at 0 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes, and finally at 180 minutes post-lactulose ingestion. Over the following 28 days, volunteers ingested two 200 mg ferrosulfate tablets daily. At day 28, volunteers repeated the lactulose test, providing breath samples at the four time points mentioned above. Breath bags samples were all sent to Alston Medical Labs in Cambridge and analyzed using SIFT MS technology. Targeted data were interrogated for statistical significance. In figure 2, it is shown that the exhaled compounds compositions in ambient samples were different from those in breath, and that the two ambient samples, one taken at the collection site in Manchester, which is called the room ambient, and the other at Alstone Labs in Cambridge, called the lab ambient, are both different from each other. There is also some overlap with the breath samples and the room ambient, which will be discussed in the conclusions. T 
Table 1 shows that among the compounds investigated, 7 showed significant changes after 28 days of iron supplementation. This was recorded at time zero, before the lactulose challenge. In figure three, three compounds were further investigated, propanoic acid, acetic acid, and hydrogen sulfide. The first two compounds significantly increased after 28 days of iron supplementation, following lactulose ingestion. This is in comparison to the day one samples, which were taken before iron ingestion. Highest differences were observed at 180 minutes. This indicates that iron supplementation was associated with microbiome changes that were most prominent in the colon. Also, both propanoic and acetic acids are short chain fatty acids, which are considered beneficial in gut health. Contrary to this, hydrogen sulfide significantly decreased over time following the lactulose challenge. This indicates that iron supplementation induced changes in the small intestines and not the colon. Hydrogen sulfide is usually considered to be detrimental to gut health. You can hear more about hydrogen sulfide in the BBCon talk, The Past, Present and Future, of breath testing for bacterial overgrowth. A limitation of this study is the high background signals in the room ambient, as mentioned earlier. This may be due to a number of sources, including cleaning agents and perfumes. Future experiments should be carried out in a room where the air is filtered. Nonetheless, all the changes that were found to be statistically significant were at least two standard deviations from the lab ambient. Taken together, despite this limitation, iron supplementation in this cohort appears to be beneficial. Further investigation on how this data release relates to signs and symptoms of the volunteers will be done to understand the effect of iron on this population. Thank you for your attention and we are happy to answer any questions at breathbiopsy at altstone.co.uk. Hello everyone, myself uh, Manohar Prasad Bandari, uh, researcher at the Institute of Clinical and Preventive Medicine of uh, University of Latvia in Riga. The title of my poster presentation is Volatilomic Patterns of Gastric Juice and Their Potential for Diagnosis of uh, Gastric Cancer. This study was uh, carried out as part of uh, the Horizon 2020 BOGAS project and a postdoc Latvia project. Uh, a bit of uh, background, the study of volatile organic compounds is an easy and economic approach for uh, the non-invasive diagnosis of disease. Uh, this study is focused on uh, the volatilomic signatures or the VOCs of gastric juice obtained from gastric cancer patients and healthy controls. Uh, the main objective was to characterize the, the chemical patterns formed by the VOCs released by gastric juice by using gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and to evaluate if the cancer-related alterations could be employed for gastric cancer detection. Uh, experimental section. Uh, the study cohort included 35 patients and 58 controls from different populations, including Ukraine, Brazil, and Colombia. The samples were collected during upper endoscopy by soaking gastric content. A minimum of 3 ml of samples uh, was taken into 20 ml glass vials. Similarly, blank sample containing 10 to 12 ml of distilled water was also taken to identify the contaminants. Uh, the collected samples were stored and transported at minus 80 degrees centigrade. For the GCMS analysis, um, heady space solid phase micro extraction as a pre-concentration method coupled with GCMS using a system was used. 
to identify the VOCs released by gastric juice samples from gastric cancer patients and the healthy controls. Uh, the extraction temperature was maintained at 70 degrees centigrade, incubation time 60 minutes, and the extraction time 3 minutes. Now on to results and discussion. Uh, the profile of GCMS chromatogram identified different volatile organic compounds from gastric juice samples. Uh, a total of 1,181 distinct compounds were um, identified in the gastric juice head, head space. Out of these compounds, six of them were occurred in at least 80% of the samples. They were hexanol, benzaldehyde, ethyl acetate, acetone, ethanol, and pyridine. Some of the compounds, such as 2-propanol, propofol, hexafluoroisopropanol, and their metabolites, they arose from the hospital environment or the sample collection site, ambient air. Um, some of these compounds could also arise from the GCMS instrument itself. Now, uh, studying the distribution of the compounds according to their chemical classes in both the study groups, uh, we found that um, the alde aldehydes were the dominant class, followed by hydrocarbons, alcohols, ketones, aromatics, terpenes, heterocyclics, and then phenols. Uh, only exception was esters, which was represented by nine species in uh, samples from patients, whereas only by three in controls. The upregulation of esters uh, in samples from patients could be because of the biochemical changes caused by the cancer causation. Similarly, while comparing the peak abundance of these compounds with occurrence above 30%, nine of them appeared at significantly higher levels in the patient group than in the controls. These compounds were uh, two of the ketones, namely two pentanone, two heptanone, four of the aldehydes, two methyl propanol, three methyl butanol, benzene acetaldehyde, and four ethyl benzaldehyde. Similarly, two alcohols, one propanol, and two ethyl one hexanol and phenol. Uh, whereas two butanone and p xylene showed lower abundance in the patients than in the controls. Therefore, uh, these compounds would be the potential biomarkers of uh, gastric cancer. In conclusions, we can say that uh, the preliminary results obtained in this study uh, shows that gastric juice is prom promising fluid, providing information on potential biomarkers of gastric cancer. Uh, more samples are needed to confirm these results. The compounds identified from the gastric juice can assist in developing non-invasive tests for the, uh, the detection and diagnosis of gastric cancer. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study reporting the composition of uh, gastric juice volatilone in different human populations. Uh, this work has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Bogas project and a postdoc Latvia project co-funded by European Regional Development Fund. Thank you so much for your attention. Hi, I'm Brett O'Brien and I'm a lead analytical scientist at Alstom Medical. The World Health Organization estimates that 3.2 million deaths were attributable to indoor air pollution in 2020, with inflammation being central to the pathophysiology. COPD, heart failure, stroke and lung cancer are just some of the associated conditions. At Alstom Medical, we are on a mission to develop a breath test for early detection of inflammatory disease using breath biopsy technology. To achieve this, we aim to identify volatile organic compounds, or VOC, markers of inflammation on breath. One of our related studies is CANDLE Study 1, or CS1, which involved collecting breath from asthmatic patients who had been exposed to emissions from inflammation-inducing candles. Using thermal desorption, gas chromatography, high-resolution mass spectrometry, 
or TDGCMS in electron ionization mode and compound discoverer software, 15 unknown molecular features were found to be markedly altered due to candle emissions. The primary focus of this poster is to highlight the utility of analysing breath in chemical ionisation or CI mode to aid structural identification and elucidation of VOCs on breath. Electron ionisation mode often does not produce a molecular ion signal, whereas CI often does. This is because CI induces less fragmentation of the parent molecule, as shown in figure 1 of the poster. The molecular ion reveals the molecular formula of the unknown VOC, thereby increasing the chance of successful identification. In this work, we explored the impact of reagent gas flow rate, electron energy and ion source temperature on the production of molecular ion as well as MS sensitivity. We found that molecular ion generation is enhanced by using higher reagent gas flows, higher electron energy and lower MS source temperature, as shown in figures 2, 3 and 4 respectively on the poster. Importantly, higher reagent gas flows reduced the signal to noise ratio of the total ion chromatogram and lower MS source temperatures are known to increase contamination buildup. These factors should be considered in addition to molecular ion generation when optimising a CI method. Although not the central focus of this work, retention indexing was found to be of great value for peak alignment between samples and standards, particularly for closely eluting stereoisomers. Our CI approach permitted detection of molecular ion for 8 of the 15 VOCs of interest on CS1 breath, which substantially expedited their identification. An example chromatogram of one of these molecular features on breath is shown in figure 5 of the poster. The VOCs identified in this exposure work are currently being evaluated for their potential utility as inflammatory markers in the clinic using a new targeted breathomics approach. Thank you very much for your attention and if you have any comments or questions please contact us at breathbiopsy at alstone.co.uk Pepsi conference audience, this presentation is about detection of hexonal as a volatile organic compound biomarker of cancers using the nanocomposite of gold nanoparticles and selective polymers. I am Marcy Musazadeh from Tariat Mudaris University. Volatile organic compounds are existed in different biological samples like breast. They are used for detection of different diseases like cancers, metabolic disorders, and microbial or viral infections. They are mostly detected by gas chromatography. Here, I'm going to introduce a novel and fast method for VOC detection. In this method, molecularly imprinted polymers and gold nanoparticles will be mixed and drop-casted on the surface of interdigitated electrodes. In the presence of hexanol, as the template and the analyte for sensing, the MIP will swell and the current of the system will change. As you can see, the liquid hexanol will be inserted into a steel chamber and after evaporation and becoming homogeneous by fan, it will be transferred to a second chamber which has the modified interdigitated electrodes. In the presence of different concentration of hexanol, the changes in the current will be monitored and recorded by a potentiostat. Here, the linearity curve of the sensor is presented it has a good linearity from 2.5 to 300 ppm and the calculated LOD was recorded to be 1.1 ppm. This sensor 
was very fast, the response time was only 3 seconds, and the recovery time was 39 seconds. In the selectivity test, hexanol was detected 2 or 3 times more than other VLCs, and also by an LDAPCA analysis, the hexanol was completely distinguished from other VLCs. For testing this sensor, in a real sample, liquid hexanol was inserted into different biological samples like cell culture medium, serum, plasma, urine, and saliva. After 24 hours of incubation, the gases hexanol in the head space of these biological samples was recorded by the sensor, and as you can see in this picture, this system was able to detect hexanol in the real sample. So, VOC detection sensor based on the molecularly imprinted polymers and gold nanoparticles composite is fast, sensitive, and selective. Thanks for your attention and feel free to contact us if you have any question. Hello everyone, I'm Kento Itani from Tokyo Medical and Dental University, Japan. It is a pleasure to introduce our poster at the Breast Biopsy Conference 2022. The title is Screening Diabetes Mellitus Through Monitoring Lipid Metabolism by Measuring and Imaging Breast Acetone Using Biophrometric Gas Sensors. The human body produces energy by metabolizing fatty acids when blood glucose and glycogen are not available. Ketone bodies are produced in this process and exist in the blood. Acetone, one of the ketone bodies, has high volatility and is exchanged from blood to the exhaled breast in the lung at a ratio of 330 to 1. Particularly, patients with diabetes mellitus who cannot utilize glucose as an energy source emit more than 1 ppm of acetone, which is higher than healthy people at rest. To our best knowledge, Highly sensitive and selective acetone gas sensors having real-time measurement capability and non-reactivity to humidity in biological gases are not available on Earth. So, we have been developing gas phase biosensor systems with the help of high substrate specificity of enzymes. The secondary alcohol dehydrogenase called SADH is one of the NADH-dependent enzymes. When SADH catalyzes the reaction of acetone, Coenzyme NADH has fluorescence, is oxidized, and the fluorescence disappears. By using this enzymatic reaction, we developed a fiber optic acetone gas sensor and acetone gas imaging system. The fiber optic gas acetone gas sensor was constructed with an ultraviolet light emitting diode, optical fibers, a flow cell, an SADH membrane, band bus filters, and a photomolecular prior tube. The SADH membrane was an air-liquid diaphragm of the flow cell that allows continuous measurement of a gaseous sample. The middle right graph shows characteristics of the acetone biosensor. In fact, the change in fluorescence intensity was negative, but we showed the amount of fluorescence change instead of low data in order to enhance visibility. The amount of fluorescence change was according to the concentration of acetone. Our sensor enabled us to quantify 20 ppb to 5.3 ppm of acetone, which range was including the breast concentration of healthy and DM patients. By using the developer sensor, first, we measure the dynamic change in breast acetone concentration caused by an exercise in fasting state. As shown in the graph, the concentration of breast acetone increased by reacting exercise activity. We would like to mention that all human subject experiments are approved by the IRB of Tokyo Medical and Data University. After that, we investigate the possibility of classifying DM type 1, DM type 2, and healthy subject by measuring breast acetone. As a result, we were able to distinguish not only healthy and DM patients, but also DM type 1 and DM type 2 with a significant difference. We would like to emphasize DM patients are already getting treated at the hospital. Therefore, blood glucose levels were not so high. 
We believe that if we had someone with hidden biodiabetes, we are able to find them by using this sensor. Another topic of our poster is gas imaging system. The imaging system was constructed by expanding the biophorometric brain spoon into two-dimensional. Acetone gas imaging was possible by capturing a spatial temporal change of process on the SADH membrane, as shown in the images. The experimental data indicated that image-based quantitative gas sensing was possible as well as of hyper optic gas sensors. We achieved monitoring a gradual change in glucose metabolism to lipid metabolism by the system. By the way, acetone is contained not only in breath but also emanated from human skin. We have continued to develop the gas imaging system to achieve imaging of gaseous acetone emitted through the skin. Let me summarize our post. We developed highly sensitive and high selective acetone biosniffer. Also, spatial temporal imaging of gaseous acetone was possible by using biophorometric gas imaging system. By using that system, real-time monitoring lipid metabolism and DM classification was demonstrated. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions or comments, please post them on the page. Also, do not forget to vote if you're interested. Thank you for listening. My name is Wout Duto. I am working as an R&D project leader for IMAC, a Belgian R&D and innovation hub for nanotechnology. In this poster presentation, I would like to present to you the work that IMAC has done in developing a fast point of care PCR test for infectious diseases, which is based on a novel way to capture aerosol from exhaled breath and run molecular diagnostics on this breath sample. Today, we have proven the value of this technology for COVID-19 but we are now actively looking to expand our menu to other respiratory infectious diseases that can be detected in breath. Like many other uh, innovations, it's actually the COVID-19 pandemic that sparked us to start working on this as it confronted us with the limitations of existing diagnostic technologies. To overcome these limitations, we come up uh, with a new concept for a breath test. This breath test needed to be reliable. It also needed to be more comfortable than the traditional nasopharyngeal swab. And also turnaround time had to be drastically uh, reduced. Since we would capture and detect the virus in exhaled breath, which is exactly there where it is known to spread, we also hoped that this test would allow us to detect infectiousness rather than infection. In order to get there, we of course had to develop the technology. In this case, the technology is a new micro-machine silicon sieve that would allow us to capture the small aerosols in the breath before performing a qPCR on that chip. The chip itself, zooming in on it, um, the principle will become clear. The chip works as a miniaturized sieve, a sort of maze for air, so to speak. The holes in this sieve are slightly misaligned so that the air needs to make a sharp turn to pass through the other side. Smaller particles manage to make that turn and go through, but the bigger particles from 300 micron onwards collide on the back of the sieve through impaction. These bigger particles may contain viral RNA, which we assumed could be detected using a molecular PCR technique. In a next clinical study, this is exactly what we set out to prove. We collected um, samples from 32 positive patients in the hospital, as well as 22 healthy volunteers. All healthy volunteers tested negative both on uh, in PPCR as on breath, learning us that the negative percentage agreement or specificity was 100%. Positive patients confirmed positive by means of the golden standard in PSWAP. Um, out of those 32 positive patients, 24 also tested positive on the breath, whereas eight tested negative on breath. This amounts to a total positive percentage agreement or a sensitivity of 75%. However, we've learned that this is actually close to 100% in the first days of infection. Indeed, in a follow-up second clinical study, we screened high-risk contacts of non-infected individuals. The aim here was to have insights into day zero, which is the first day a person, um, a test would indicate that a person was infected. We uh, then followed up those patients up to seven or even 10 days following that first test. Zooming in on the results, you can clearly see that the sensitivity of the QPCR on breath 
superseded that of the rapid antigen test performance and was equally uh, good or even better than the performance of the MP swap in the first two days of infection. From day three to day six onwards, all tests performed equally well, but importantly from day seven, you can see that the breath test quickly turned negative way before the other tests which would then uh, stay positive for days or even weeks to come. In a recent paper, we have claimed this pattern is compatible with an infectiousness test. Importantly, all the studies I've mentioned above were done um, with a proof of concept version of the technology. In the so-called non-integrated workflow, a lot of manual steps still needed to be done in order to obtain the PCR results. Remember that we actually wanted to make a fast point of care test, which is why we also spent considerable time and effort into actually designing, developing and building a, an, an integrated workflow. This integrated workflow consists of a breath sampling device, which would allow us to collect the sample, then fill and seal the silicon sieve in the breath sampler itself and insert the device into a qPCR machine, allowing us to um, have a sample to result time close to 15 minutes. In a last clinical study, we actually validated that this integrated workflow works equally well as the non-integrated workflow we used to obtain all the results we've discussed um, in the clinical studies above. To sum up, we have developed a new technology to enable aerosol collection at the point of care in a fast, comfortable one-minute breath sample, and then combine the sampling method with a sensitive molecular backend. We have validated this technology for COVID-19, and we are convinced that it will have value for other respiratory infectious diseases, bringing Excel breath diagnostics closer to the clinical practice. I thank you all for listening. Um, in case of questions, do reach out to me on the email address shown on the slides. Thanks.